What's up, puppy friends? I've gotten a number of questions over the past uh, few weeks and months regarding specific essential or core colors that I feel I always want to have in my painting toolbox. And I thought it'd be a great opportunity to record this video and talk briefly about um, what you see here as what I feel are the core of my palette, which I always want to have, why I feel that they're essential to me. And then I also want to briefly talk about my preference for paint manufacturers, why I prefer for the time being EK over any other paint manufacturer. And then my opinion on owning a lot of paints for color stepping versus relying on having fewer paints for mixing. So we'll start off with what I find are my essential colors and I'll start with my primers. Because I live in Canada and we have a cold, humid winter for six months of the year, I tend to rely a lot on using the airbrush to do my priming. And so I use Vallejo Surface Primer Black as my main primer. I prefer using black because it allows me to start with my deep shadows. I can have sort of my darkest colors laid down. And the issue that I always run into when I'm painting on top of a gray or a white primer is I need to be super careful about really, really deep shadows, especially on tabletop models that have guns, arms, weapons, or bits that are in the way that make it awkward to get that brush into those um, inside or hidden angles. On a light primer, you have to actually make sure that you get the paint into them. With a black primer, they're already black, it's the deepest shadow, so as you're painting and working your way up, if you can't get your brush in there, it's hidden in black and it's not as big of a deal. In the odd instances where I do want to Zenith Prime, for models that are a lot brighter in the color palette, or maybe I want to work on a display piece that um, I want to have brighter colors with, or colors that I know will take a lot of base coating and working up, and I want to be able to get those colors down quickly, like yellows, whites, etc. I will use Surface Primer Gray to do that Zenith Priming. A lot of colors tend to not base coat well on top of white, and I'm looking primarily at blues and purples. Especially if I want to go to a darker color with them, a lot of those mid to dark tone paints for those colors tend to not work well on white, but they work a little bit better on gray. And then when I'm painting white on a gray, I can still work my way up. Whereas on white primer, I can only work down, which makes it a little harder, especially in the early sketching phase. When I'm working on larger pieces like terrain, vehicles, or if I need to mass prime something like for an army, I can oftentimes start with a aerosol primer. So my preference for this is any sort of matte primer that's uh, made for plastic. So the range that I'm using right now is Rust-Oleum Painter's Touch. This is fairly inexpensive. It's a flat black primer, um, very equivalent to this, probably even flatter in terms of matteness. And the can itself is fairly cheap. I'd say $8 from Canadian Tire or Home Depot. I used to use Krylon a lot, but that range has either been um, discontinued or no longer carried in Canada. It's incredibly hard to find, at least for me in Toronto. So this one is a lot easier to get a hold of. I can, I'm only really limited to using this in the summer months. You can use it in the winter, but a combination of temperature and the moisture and humidity in the air can make it trickier to use. You have to be uh, much more careful, much more quick about this in the winter time. What I tend to like to do is start off with this, especially on bigger pieces, get the majority out of the way, and then bring it indoors and switch to the airbrush to finish priming some of those awkward angles. Moving on to the metallics. Um, I've tried metallics from Games Workshop, Vallejo, and um, Scale 75. And I've found that Scale 75 out of all of them provides the best range of metallics in terms of color tone coverage and finish. And there, there's no equivalent. And I'll talk briefly about sort of my issues with scale 75 moving on. And I think that even with those issues, these metallic paints are still my go-tos, even with the troubles I have with scale 75. So um, for doing silvers, I default to scale colors, black metal, heavy metal, and then I use Vallejo Air Chrome for my highlights. So this gives me a, a dark metal up into medium and a super bright range. And because Air Chrome is such a bright and reflective color, 
I can really push the values on the silvers much more than um, what can be found here. Black metal, despite how it shows on the bottle, is actually a fairly dark color. And I think there's only one or two paints I found darker than it. And honestly, if I need to go darker than black metal, I just mix in a bit of black and um, go to town. For golds, depending on the specific tone I want, I have a variety. Um, Viking gold and decayed metal are great for warm or burnished coppers and golds that are more orangey or red in tone, and you can highlight them with, uh, I believe this is orca gold, dwarven gold. Um, you can also mix in some air chrome or heavy metal into the gold mixes to brighten them up. If you don't want to push the range too much in the yellow with the dwarven gold and you want to keep it in sort of this ready brown tone. And then for something that's a little bit more cold, I like to use necro gold and elven gold. And again, um, if I don't want to use elven gold to highlight, I can mix in air chrome or heavy metal to maintain this um, very desaturated, very cold necro gold base. I love having dark sea blue as a, a deep, desaturated blue tone that works great for building up a variety of cold tones, whether it's blue, greens. It's also really great for nuancing shadows. And because it's not a super intense blue, it works great as um, a, a mixing tone to either push the temperature of a color, especially in a darker range, more towards that cold range. And it's just a very flexible color to work with. And for that reason, I also like Tenebrous Gray. This is a, a gray black that leans on the purple tone. And where other um, blacks or shadow tones you can tend to mix and get around with, I haven't found a great way to mix a tenebrous gray equivalent. And I love using the shadow tone to start a lot of my more earthy tones, a lot of my reds, my browns, um, sometimes my skin tones, depending on the specific color I want. And then much like with dark sea blue, because it leans into that purple tone, it's a great nuance in color to push shadows in without being too saturated. When I paint, especially army models, I tend to have warm highlights and cold shadows. And I love using these two, both as a base coat to help establish that coldness and then a nuance afterwards, either by hand or with the airbrush to glaze in and push that con contrast in the shadows. I also like using a purple tone for that reason. And Voyo Game Air's Hex Lichen was my go-to for the longest time, still is. It's a really great color. Depending on how diluted you mix the color, you can either use it pure or um, add in a lot of water to knock down the intensity. It can go from very soft to very intense purple. For times when I don't want to be mixing too much or I want something that's a little bit more, um, more saturated out of the bottle without being too saturated, I've been using Games Workshop's new Drushi Violet Wash a lot. Note that this is the, or sorry, shade. Note that this, this is the Mark II pot, not the original Mark I, which is more more intense and not as translucent out of the bottle. When I'm applying my highlights or mixing up my highlights because I want to have those warm tones, I like to use AK's Pastel Yellow or Scale Colors Heike Yellow to create those mixes. Very often, the default to creating highlights is to mix in a white. And the problem with using pure white is it tends to desaturate your colors and it pushes it into that pastel range. And to warm it back up or to bring back some of that intensity or that saturation, you need to mix in a bit of a yellow. By using a high yellow or a pastel yellow, you sort of combine that yellow and white tone, create those highlights, brighten up your colors without desaturating them as much as you would with a white. So for that reason, I like having these two. I find that they're fairly equivalent. I've been leaning more towards pastel yellow largely because I prefer the AK paints, but I find that Heike yellow is the better color. It has a little bit more uh, of the sort of yellow ochre mixed in there. Um, and so having both is nice. If I had to pick one, I would probably actually go with Heike yellow, even with the issues I have with the scale color range. Nilahak Oxide I love because it's such a flexible color in terms of doing easy blue power opens. I've been using a lot for my Blood Angels and for my Necrons, but it's also great for doing rust effects, especially on non-metal metal. So when you're doing vertebris on copper, on gold, 
even on some more non-traditional metal colors that have a sort of um, coppery tone to it. Having this color on hand right out of the pot, even when you're, you're sort of clunking it on, it doesn't have a super um, opaque finish. It does take quite a few coats to build up and it's uh, just the perfect tone I found for doing that copper verdigris that I haven't been able to find in any other color from scale, AK or Vallejo. So for doing verdigris, this is my go-to. And then you, you always have to have a black and a white and different blacks in different ranges provide different finishes depending on whether you want something that's a little bit more, more matte, a little bit more glossy. I know scale colors, the mar black leans a little bit more on a black gray. So I think it's essential to have that black or a white. In terms of paint brands, I actually prefer AKs because of their finish out of the pot, because of the way that they don't tend to gunk up when you dilute them too much, especially in the white. And then just the overall finish, I find that they're the white and the black that I am most comfortable with. And that actually segues nicely into my preference between the four different brands I've used. So that's Vallejo, Games Workshop, Scale 75, and AK. So when it comes to paint brands I've used over the years, there's four primary brands that I've always defaulted to. Games Workshop, which is where I actually started my hobby career. I used them exclusively for about 10 years, largely because I only ever went to Games Workshop stores. And then as my friends opened up their hobby store and as I branched out into non-Games Workshop products, I introduced Voyo for a number of years, Scale 75, and then finally AK Interactive. As an overview, I find all four paint brands have a very similar variety of colors. There's a lot of them within each individual paint range, either the more saturated fancy style colors or the more desaturated historical earth colors or earth tone colors. If you're looking for the more historical desaturated colors, Vallejo and AK tend to have a broader range, whereas Games Workshop and Scale 75 tend to focus on more fantasy, high saturation colors. Vallejo has their game color range, which is where a lot of their high saturation fancy colors lie. It also tends to be more glossy, and I'll talk about that when I go through the individual paint ranges. Just be aware that for Vallejo, their more earth tone, more desaturated colors are the more satin or flat finishes, and then their high intensity fancy colors are a high gloss finish. So something to bear in mind. For Games Workshop, my largest issue with their paint range is the actual paint pots themselves. I don't understand why they insist on sticking with their flip top. Maybe they have some sort of um, deal with a manufacturer who creates these pots on super cheap. I hate them. They don't stack or store particularly well. They're large, they're chunky. This flip top design is not airtight, so it means that once you open them, the paints have uh, an expiry date. They don't tend to last long. Honestly, given the price, yes, you can argue that you could transfer them to a dropper bottle, but that's money on top of the actual cost of the paint itself because you have to invest in empty dropper bottles. And then your time to actually transfer the paints themselves. Just, for what they charge, I want their paints to work out of the gate. And for that reason, I don't carry Games Workshop of Coats. Although I will say that their contrast, shade, and technical range are still very good. Because they are um, fairly liquid in terms of their consistency, not quite as viscous as an acrylic paint. The, the fact that their dropper bottles aren't airtight doesn't have as high impact because they don't dry out as quickly. And then, at least for me, I tend to go with them fairly quickly enough that them drying up over the course of a few months isn't as big of an issue. And then because I can't get these technical shade or contrast colors in any of the other ranges, except for maybe Vallejo Game Air, I do tend to like to keep a couple of these paints on hand. As I already mentioned with Vallejo, the biggest issue is the finish. The model color where a lot of their more desaturated tones sit is a satin finish. And then their game color range where a lot of their high intensity, more fancy style colors are, it's very gloss, which is absolutely not my preference. I prefer a matte finish. And it's for that reason that I tend to not carry too many layers and I am actually slowly phasing them out. 
I do still own a couple of their model colors, largely for legacy reasons. I have my Necrons and my Nighthaunt that still use a lot of Vallejo colors. And until I can find suitable equivalents in the AK range, I still carry them on hand. But with all that being said, I think Vallejo is still a flexible range. I've never had clocking issues with their tubes, nor have I ever had separation issues. So I think that they're a very flexible, very consistent brand, and you never go wrong carrying Vallejo's. I think out of all four brands, they're also the cheapest. And so that may be a selling factor for those of you who don't want to spend $10 a two for Games Workshop. I think scale and AK tend to be around the $6 or $7 um, range, maybe even 8 I think, for some of the newer paints. So that may be a selling point for you for Vallejo. For a couple of years, I actually really enjoyed Scale 75's range. Their paint finishes are incredibly matte. That in combination with the fact that they have a lot of more intense, uh, more saturated fancy colors that are still flat, means I do still like to keep a couple of them in my wheelhouse. My issue with these tends to be with the, the high pigment ratio, which can be a selling point, but it's also a huge con. And that leads into also the issue I have with the tubes. So the high pigment ratio does mean that these colors cover very well and you can thin them quite a bit and still maintain that saturation. However, it does lead to clogging issues and gunking issues. So one of the issues I tend to have to do with Scale 75 is when I buy them, I tend to always have to use one or two of these paint mixing um, steel balls. When you buy the paint, you have to pop these tubes off or these tips off. Put one or two of them in there and that'll help you with mixing the colors. But even still, I think these each of them have two of these steel balls in them. You end up with paint drying in the top of the tube, which means that you're constantly having to use something like a steel pin or a paper clip to have to pierce the tip to get paint out. And then I've also found that over time, these paint tubes split. I don't know if it's because of the way that the paint dries, I guess it forces the plastic to expand and you end up with the split that runs down um, two sides. And over time, as you're trying to squirt paint on the bottle, um, the paint doesn't just squirt from the tip, it squirts from the sides, further exacerbates that splitting issue. And I think over time I found that the, the paint, I can no longer put a little gallop on my paint palette, it ends up just um, coming out in huge chunks. And so for that reason, despite being such a flat range, having a great uh, paint pigment to medium ratio, so allowing for great coverage and strong intensity, even with heavy dilution, I'm slowly phasing out the scale of colors because of these issues. Constantly having to um, deal with dry paint, splitting paint tubes, I just, I don't want to deal with it. I want to be able to get my paint from the tube on the palette, move quickly and move on. I'm phasing out my scale colors. Which leads me finally to the AK Interactive range, which has been my default for, I would say the past year. And I've slowly been phasing out all of my scale color ranges, except for my metallics. And then while I do maintain a couple of Vallejo Legacy colors for some of my older paint schemes, I have been actively trying to replace the Vallejo with AK Interactive. Until I find issues with the AK range, I think this is gonna be my go-to. Their finishes are fairly matte. Some of them are a little bit more on the satin side, but never leaning into the gloss. And then because it has a consistent finish, regardless of whether we're going for the high intensity, high saturation fancy range, or more the desaturated historical um, earth tone range, it's just a great brand to work with. My only issue with this range is that I found certain colors, particularly in the greens and the purples, tend to separate in the pot. So you do still need to make sure that you are mixing these fairly heavily before you use them, especially in the mid dark tone ranges. As you use the paints more, you'll become familiar with which paint colors do tend to separate. And so for the ones that do, you'll again want to just put in one or two of these um, steel balls the tops come off just like the scale colors do. It'll help with the mixing and it'll help keep the colors fairly mixed. 
and uh, not separated. Because a lot of what I paint is tabletop gaming pieces, it does require that I apply a coat of varnish to seal and protect the miniatures from handling. So my go-to, because I prefer a matte finish lately, has been Mr. Hobby's Super Clear. It's equivalent to Games Workshop's Purity Seal, a little bit more on the flatter side without being quite as flat as Tesco's Dole Coat. Just a couple of quick sprays protects the models from gameplay and while it does flatten the colors a little bit, provides a very good matte finish that doesn't really impact the, the overall finish of the colors that I've painted onto the miniatures. This also works well because in some instances where I do use paints like Vallejo that are a little bit more on the satin side, using a flat finish does knock back that satin finish and flattens overall. So for tabletop pieces, this is a great varnish to use and at least for me in Toronto, fairly accessible to get. I did use Games Workshop's Purity Seal for the longest time, which is very equivalent, a little bit more on the satin side, but not actually being satin. Games Workshop's new Munitorum finish, I think I'm pronouncing that right, is a little bit more on the satin side, more so than Purity Seal. And so for that reason, I tend to steer clear of that product as well. So while I don't have a lot of core or essential colors, I still do own quite a large number of paints. I probably fill up about um, three and a half of these paint boxes, just full of colors, right? I have my one tone box here, I have my cold tone box, and then I have my neutrals, my metallics, and my uh, supports, so glazes, nuancing, etc. And along that, a fair number of Games Workshop's technical contrast and shade colors, which I would count as nuancing. Because I do do a lot of army painting and a lot of painting for the tabletop, where I'm not painting one offs, but I'm painting a lot of rank and file, there are a couple of things that are really important to me, and that's speed and consistency. One of the problems that you run into with mixing, yes, you only have a couple of colors and you can sort of get from one place to another with a limited color range, but the problem becomes speed and consistency. Having to constantly mix the intermediary steps and then once you've mixed them, your finish isn't always going to be the same, especially if your start and end goals are mixed colors. One of the challenges, especially when you're bouncing around between projects and let's say you paint a couple of units for an army, you take a break for a couple months or even a year or two, and then you go back. Are you able to consistently and reliably mix those colors again to match what you've painted before? In my experience, no. Paint colors um, do change over time. Your memory fades. Even when you write it down, you can never exactly get the same ratio. And unless your start and end points are the same, it's very hard to get that consistency across the board. And when you're painting an army, at least for me, having those different finishes across different models or units can be incredibly jarring. Additionally, I want to be able to quickly go from step to step to step for an army because it helps with speed painting. Being able to, for example, if you look at a red range, right? If I start from a uh, sort of this, whatever this is, African shadow, and I basically step through uh, burnt red, blood red, scarlet red, amaranth, and then maybe burnt orange, right? I can go one, two, three, four, five, six. If I'm assembly lining five or 10 models, I'm not mixing, I just know I'm. it's pot one, five or 10 models, pot two, five or 10 models, pot three, four, five, and I can really grind it out. Whereas if I'm mixing, it becomes a lot harder to move quickly through them. And again, you end up with an inconsistent finish. And it takes more time constantly having to bounce between the two different colors, mixing the exact ratio, and then applying it to your um, five or 10 models before moving on to the next step. And so it's for that reason, I tend to gravitate a lot more towards color stepping because I paint a lot of armies and a lot of tabletop models where speed and consistency and I guess returnability, for lack of a better word, is key. I want to be able to use this mix know that it's this literally this progression of four or five colors. And even if I leave a project for one, two, or even three years, I can come back. And I know 
as long as those paint colors haven't changed, um, I can just go back one, two, three, four, five of those colors, and I'll have exactly the same finish as what I painted before. Now, there are rare instances where if you are away from the project for too long, uh, a number of years where the actual paint manufacturer has changed the paint ratio of the paints. You saw that sometimes with Games Workshop, where pots from five or six years ago aren't the same as pots from now, even though the colors are the same. I actually encountered that issue with my net by hot where I painted a batch of them in 2018 because their games workshop colors, they ended up drying out. And when I went back to them in 2021, um, some of the colors had actually changed and I wasn't able to replicate the exact same mix. Thankfully, I was able to find equivalents in scale 75 and AK and I was able to swap them out the color finish is a little different, but overall, I think from four or five feet away, it's still close enough that I'm okay with it. It bothers me a little bit because I know it's there, but it's so minute that it's not as big a deal. Where color stepping is less important and where you have a lot of flexibility to mix more is when you're painting display pieces, characters, and one-offs where consistency isn't key where you have that flexibility to, to play around with and mix different colors, get different finishes, where you don't have to replicate your results. I think that's really where having a more limited color palette or a limited color range and mixing your colors can really shine. And I think that about wraps up this video in terms of covering what I think are essential colors. My brand preference between the big four and then color mixing versus having defined color steps. So. I hope you enjoyed. I hope it gave you some insight into the way I break down my color palettes and maybe it'll um, help give you some ideas for how to build your own color toolbox and maybe which brand you want to gravitate towards. So thanks for watching. Make sure you give it a like and follow for more awesome weekly content. If you want to check out my other social media platforms, I'll make sure to have the links in the video description below. And as always, until next time, happy hobbying.